So good morning. My name is Mary Alice. I'm the public affairs manager at Maine Association of Nonprofits, and I am so pumped that you're joining us this morning because I love elections and I love talking about elections. I think you are going to have a fun time. So thank you. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling in from our office in Portland, and I um, am going to hand it over to Jeanette Andre for just a moment to introduce herself because we are doing this event with Maine Philanthropy Center, which is phenomenal. So Jeanette, go ahead and say good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. My name is Jeanette Andre. I'm the president and CEO of Maine Philanthropy Center. I use the she series pronouns and I am calling in from our shared offices at the Equality Community Center here in Portland. And Mary Alice, do you want me to say more or is that enough? No, do it. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, great, 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 great. Cool. Um, I uh, this is a lot of pressure to really start everything off and the recording. Holy moly. Can... <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I'm happy to be here uh, three days after official uh, voter registration day. But in my world, every day can be voter registration day. And hopefully you take away some um, tools and tips to be able to engage your communities here. Um, MPC feels this is a priority and is here today because um, broadly speaking, we um, think we believe that democracy is a priority, and this is one um, large piece of a vibrant um, and representative democracy. And so um, we are happy to partner with the Maine Association of Nonprofits to partner with our nonprofit infrastructure organization because we wanted to model how funders can partner with nonprofits too in this. Um, and one of the ways that you can do this is um, prioritizing it and um, and resourcing it. And so we are modeling this partnership for how funders can show up in this space with Maine Association of Nonprofits. Um, uh, and and uh, just so pleased that we get to develop a toolkit together that I believe makes a big impact in our work here in Maine. Awesome, thank you, Jeanette. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing now. And I'm going to introduce the the VIP of the morning, which is <laughs> Gwen Stembridge, who's calling in, not from Portland, Maine, um, but who is calling from Nonprofit Vote. And we are really excited to have Gwen on the line to talk about uh, voter education, voter registration, and the things that nonprofits can do in elections. And Gwen, I'll kick it over to you to talk a little bit more and start start the morning off. Thank you so much, Mary Alice and Jeanette. Um, so grateful that y'all uh, are here to spend your morning with us. Um, and we're gonna make this as fun as we can. I know some of us are uh, really think that uh, voting and um, voter engagement is really fun and exciting. And so I hope that um, that will just spread um, among all of you if you're not already on that that team. So I'm going to start out by sharing my screen um, as we get going here. And yes, please do. Um, if you have clarifying questions, please do ask those um, in the chat and I will count on Mary Alice to help me uh, identify and uplift those um, if I miss them in the chat. But i um, super excited to be here with you all today. Um, so this, I'm Gwen Stembridge with Nonprofit Vote, my pronouns are she, her, and um, I'm, I'm excited to present this and really excited that you all, um, as the two organizations working with nonprofits and working with the philanthropic sector, um, are doing this together. This is not something that all states are doing. Um, you all are very lucky in Maine to have such collaboration between these two organizations. Um, and I really, I've been bragging on you all to other states that we work with, um, just because I think this is so important to do together. So. Um, I'm I'm excited to spend this time together. So this is me, Gwen. I wanted to just have this slide to give you a little bit of background. Also, I'm coming to this work um, from working in direct service nonprofits. Um, I've spent some time with United Way. Um, I'm an AmeriCorps VISTA alum. If there's anybody else um, who's a uh, VISTA alum in the room, um, I love it. Um, and, um, and then most recently from kind of the advocacy side of things um, at Equality Ohio and then um, at the Trevor Project um, doing um, advocacy, community organizing. So I've kind of seen both 
sides um, of this world and now get to um, uh, kind of combine that work and uh, support organizations like you all, nonprofits like you all that are doing beautiful, wonderful direct service work um, and give you the tools that you need to uh, do some voter engagement. So this is what our, our time will look like today. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who is Nonprofit Vote if you're not familiar yet. Um, we've got some highlights from, uh, I always like to give you all data. I think that can be really valuable, especially from the national perspective. Um, I wanna equip you with data to make sure that you are able to validate this work and, um, and really uh, highlight this work to, um, to your funders, to your board, to all of those folks. Um, and then we're gonna talk just this nonpartisan voter engagement guide. I wanna give you just a little, uh, little taste of it. Um, and then we're going to talk about voter education, we're going to talk about voter registration, some best practices um, around that, and there are plenty of things that you can do between now and the election, I just want to remind you of that. Um, some folks might look at this and say, oh my gosh, it's, we're already, we've had these debates, we've had everything happening, it's, it's coming so soon, um, but there's still plenty that you can do, so. Um, and I would not um, be true to my community organizing training if I did not leave you with a call to action. Um, so that is um, that is there as well. And then we'll make sure that we leave time for question and answer. So to start us out, a nonprofit vote really exists to support you all as nonprofit leaders. We were started in 2005, so we've been doing this for a minute. Um, and we're doing that uh, because we believe in and envision uh, a more inclusive democracy where all voices can be heard. And we know that there are certain voices that have been um, in some way uh, excluded or have been historically marginalized um, or currently marginalized um, from a lot of these systems. And so um, we know that you all as nonprofits are often serving those communities and are often in those communities. And so um, we wanna, this is why we do this work with you all, with nonprofits in particular, because we want to ensure that those voices are heard. I'm gonna start out with just a little poll, a little question uh, for you all, and you can put your answers to this in the chat. Um, and this information is based on our report, uh, America's Nonprofits Get Out the Vote. But what percentage of nonprofits do you think do voter engagement generally? Do we have any guesses in, uh, if you're gonna put your answers in the chat? Twenty-five percent is a guess. All right, that's a guess. Eighteen, twenty, sixty, yes, ten, two. Oh, all right. We've got some optimism, and we've got some not quite optimism there about that. Um, the number that we came up with in this report is about twenty percent, or about one in five nonprofits um, do this work. And some people are going to look at that and say, "Oh my gosh, that's a lot." Didn't really expect that. Other folks are looking at that and they're saying, "That's not enough." Um, and um, I tend to be in the latter category. Um, I might be a little biased, but um, I do think that more nonprofits can be doing this work. Um, because really, at the end of the day, the percentage of nonprofits that can do this voter engagement work is really almost all. Um, and so if this is something that is newer to you um, as a nonprofit leader, um, I want to encourage you that you are able to do this legally and um, and uh, pretty easily. There are things you can do that are really simple. Um, and we're going to give you the tools to do that. So I'd like to start out, like I said, with data. Um, this nonprofit power report came out in March of this year. So it is fresh, fresh, hot data. Um, and the, the big point that came out of this, please do spend time. If you are a data nerd, please do spend time with this report. But um, the highlight of it is that voters engaged by nonprofits are 10 percentage points more likely to actually follow through and vote. And so this is really significant. You can take this data, you can take it to your funders, you can take it to your board, you can take it to you know anybody who is kind of questioning this work and like, why, why should this be part of our mission? We're already doing a lot. Um, well, you can make a really big impact. Um, and you can make a really big impact, not just for the general population of the communities you serve, 
Um, but when we separate out that data to um, voters of color, to people of color, 12 percentage points, uh, 12 percentage point boost, um, 15 percentage point boost for those earning between 20 and $30,000, so lower income folks, um, and then 14 percentage points when we're talking about young voters, 18 to 24. So these populations often that are, um, have been either historically excluded from the process or don't really have as many resources, um, and the system is not set up to serve them, this, you all as nonprofits are set up to ensure that these populations um, and these communities have access to the voting process. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's special about election 2024. So it's been four years um, since we've voted for a president. And so um, uh, a little bit has changed in that time. Um, but I wanna remind folks also that uh, I hear often, oh, this is a this is a, an election year in this election year. Um, and I like to respond by saying every year is an election year. Um, and there are always things to vote on every year that we're gonna get a lot of uh, media attention and a lot of spotlight on the presidential election, um, but want to remind you that there are a lot of other things down the ballot, um, especially things that might be more directly, even more directly impactful on your communities than the president. Um, so we've got all of these seats in Congress. We've got um, court and um, judicial seats that are up on the ballot. There are statewide ballot um, measures in many, many states. Uh, there are state, you know, Senate, House, and then also mayors, city council, all of those things. So don't forget, uh, as you're doing this voter engagement, that there are lots of things down the ballot that you want to make sure you're um, talking about and including. It's been four years since the pandemic really shifted uh, the way that we do elections. Um, and so a lot of things have changed in that time. Want to make sure that you're taking health and safety into consideration there. Um, but also some state election laws have changed in that time. And particularly you all have online voter registration, which is super exciting um, and really makes that um, more accessible. More options are always good um, because that means more people can have access to the process. So pay attention to those state election laws. Um, those things, uh, there are things that have changed uh, in the past four years. So this is a really big focus. I like to start out this section on staying nonpartisan. Um, I like to start it out by saying, I am not an attorney and this is not legal advice. Um, I will give you some references to um, a, a wonderful resource in Alliance for Justice and Boulder Advocacy. They are attorneys um, and they're able to answer some of those questions. And I'm sure if you have um, other questions um, that are more specific uh, to Maine, um, I'm sure Mary Alice and Jeanette have good resources for you as well. But I want to talk about just in general, the things that nonprofits are able to do. And th these really range from things that take a lot of investment and a lot of time to things that are really easy that you can do tomorrow. Um, oh, you can do them on Monday, um, uh, you know, that you can do easily to incorporate into the work that you're already doing as a nonprofit. So um, you can register voters. There was already a reference. We had National Voter Registration Day was this past Tuesday, um, but it is not too late to register voters. Um, and that is a thing that you all can do um, as long as you are doing it in a way that is not favoring one party or one candidate over another, um, you can absolutely register voters. You can send election reminders. So you get the information from your local county office, um, elections office, and you can amplify that information. So what time do the polls open? What time do the polls close? Where's the link to get information about voter registration um, or about early voting or about you know any of these things? Um, you can send out any of that information. You can distribute nonpartisan candidate guides. Um, this may be something that you want to do now. It may be something that another organization is doing and you can help to amplify their candidate guides um, if it's an issue that impacts you. Hosting candidate forums, I would say it's not too late to do that either. Um, as long as you are giving equal time to each of those candidates, you can help to organize that. Um, if you uh, are not hosting a candidate forum, you can also show up or encourage people to go to another um, uh, candidate forum that's being hosted by another organization um, and go there and, you know, ask questions. If they have a, a, a question answer session, you can ask questions about the issues that impact your community. 
You can educate voters about options for voting, right? In person, early, register online, all of those options. You can drive people to the polls. Um, if you already have access to some kind of transportation, um, if you have a bus that your nonprofit owns, if you have, you know, if you regularly give people bus passes or things like that, you can um, even coordinate volunteers to get people to the polls. You can support or oppose ballot measures as well. Some folks um, have questions about this one often because um, ballot measures are something that is, you know, on the ballot, um, but it is not associated with a candidate. And so um, they're not considered partisan. Um, you all can um, weigh in on ballot measures. Those are going to be subject to lobbying laws. So do pay attention to that aspect. Um, but as far as staying nonpartisan, you're absolutely able to do that. And then you're able to also continue your issue advocacy. If you have a regular meeting with one of your legislators, um, or if you have, you know, a, a lobby day or something else that you do regularly, um, you can absolutely continue to do that as well. And this is really just a sampling of the things that you can do um, as a nonprofit. There are lots of options. You can get really creative with it. Um, and I saw, I think Molly shared this in um, the chat already, but um, Boulder Advocacy has this fantastic hotline where they will respond to you within basically two business days um, with questions. So um, I'm able to answer very general questions, um, but if you have specific questions about um, a specific event or something that is rele uh, relevant to your organization, I definitely recommend you reach out to them. I wanted to give you just a little preview here um, of the voter engagement guide. Um, we spent a lot of time on this. It is very comprehensive. It's very long. Um, and I say that to give you the heads up so that you don't get overwhelmed by it. Um, it is a, a toolkit and a guide for many reasons. And that one of those is that there is a beautiful table of contents. Uh, so you can look through and see, okay, what is relevant to me? Um, what are the tools from this that I'm going to use? I don't think any of us expect you to, um, you know, read through and memorize um, every one of these pages. Um, it is really a, a toolkit in that sense um, and use the things that are uh, relevant and helpful to you. I wanted to just walk you through a couple of the sections that you'll see in it. So some things about nonpartisanship, um, you'll see some things about how to make a plan. Um, you'll see some, some really great tips about talking to potential voters um, and then permitted nonpartisan activities. We've got some guides around candidate engagement, um, engaging young voters, engaging you know, certain populations of voters. And so this is really helpful. Um, and then the thing that I think is really cool that you all in Maine are including um, is some of these tools from this Philanthropy for Voter Engagement Initiative. Um, and uh, I know there was even a, a question, we were talking about this, a question about how do you sustain this work? How do you um, get support for this work? This work cannot be done. Um, without some kind of capacity, right? Um, and it is always helpful when there is capacity that supports this work in particular, this voter engagement work. Um, so there are lots of examples of how this work has been done in other places um, and um, all kinds of tools there that I think uh, you'll find really helpful. And then we've got some specifics to Maine as well. Um, wanna make sure that you all have your uh, local, you know, the state-based tools and resources. Um, so lots of references to things at maine.gov um, and ensuring that you have those direct links to the state elections office so that, uh, so that you've got really accurate, good information. So the next section I'm gonna talk about is voter education. So this is a pretty general uh, way to look at how do you even begin with voter education? Um, some of you, like I said, this may be really new for you. Others, this may be old hat. You may already be doing a lot of these things, um, but I like to just talk through what some of your options could be. And hopefully there's something new here that you haven't uh, thought about yet. So. When I talk about voter education, I like to kind of separate out um, two different aspects of this. Uh, there are the basics of voter education. So when do you vote? Where do you vote? And how do you vote? Those are kind of the, the basics, that information, that like tactile information that you need to get out to people. And then there's another part that is the why. 
Um, and that motivation, uh, folks who haven't necessarily been connected um, to the voting process, um, who may not have a lot of confidence in the voting process, they may be frustrated with politics generally, um, which I think they're probably in good company, right? Um, of politics can be frustrating um, in many ways and our elected leaders are never gonna be perfect and they're never gonna um, have everything that we would like in a leader. Um, but it's really important to remind folks that, um, that, that our, this process, our democracy exists um, because we want to try to build a little bit of a better world than we have right now. And so um, the, some of those keys to the why are knowledge about the voting process. So how does it work? What happens when I go, um, when I show up on um, election day? Um, what really happens to my ballot? How do I trust this system? Um, so knowledge about that process and about how the votes are counted and things like that can be helpful in building that trust um, in the system so that people feel that why they feel that motivation to vote. Um, their confidence about um, casting a ballot, knowing uh, the information that's going to be on the ballot ahead of time so that they can do their research and they don't get surprised. I moved to a new state within the past couple of years and looked at uh, my ballot ahead of time. And I'm so glad that I did because I was voting on a coroner and I was like, I don't even know how to vote on a coroner. Like, what are the things what are the qualifications that this person needs? How do I know who's gonna be a good fit for that? Um, so I, I was able to look ahead of time. I was reminded to look ahead of time and I was able to do that research and make the best decision that I knew to make. But um, having that heads up, knowing what's going to be on the ballot ahead of time is so key to building that trust and that confidence. Um, and then urgency and importance. Um, I think this is something you all can communicate. You are subject matter experts in the work that you are doing um, and in the communities that you are serving. And so um, you are able to communicate that, you know, hey, if we want better roads, if we want better schools, if we want, you know, sidewalks in our community, if we want whatever that is, um, uh, you know what's important to your community and you're able to really amplify the fact that a lot of these decisions that are made in our communities are made by elected leaders. Um, and if we are not participating, if we are not um, voting for those elected leaders, they are uh, less likely to listen to us, right? They're more likely to listen if we are engaged and if we are voting. So that's an important thing to remember. So a little bit about the, the, the when um, part. So you wanna make sure just get out the basics. It is sometimes we skip over some of these basics, but make sure that they know when uh, election day is. So Tuesday, November 5th this year in 2024, um, make sure that they know the deadline to vote by mail or vote early. Make sure that they know the polling hours. Just all of those like dates and times, make sure that you get that. On the front end, you know what it is. Your staff can um, repeat that. Anybody who you know comes through your doors or um, whoever answers your info at email, um, make sure that they know some of these basic details so that they can respond quickly and easily um, and you can become a trusted source for that information. Then there's the where. So polling places, um, early voting locations, a lot of times that is different than where people are gonna go um, on their polling uh, the, the day of the election. Um, and then where to see if their location has changed since last year. Sometimes um, those, uh, the districts will change um, and the polling place you've been going for years and years has changed. So you wanna check that, um, make sure that you've got uh, that accurate information as well and folks know where to go. And then the how, um, so eligibility, you wanna talk about um, ID requirements if folks need to get an updated ID for whatever reason, um, what they need to provide um, is important as well. Um, how to access, uh, you know, voting absentee or voting by mail or earlier in person, 
Um, make sure that they are vote ready. We're using the hashtag vote ready um, so that they are they know what, if they're gonna get a ride to the polls, that they have a reliable ride um, and um, uh, election day registration um, and then just resources in general. What are all of their resources? You wanna make sure that folks know where to go if they have additional questions. And then, and then the why of this. Um, I love this cute picture of kids because um, often, uh, well, yeah, kids, you have to be 18 um, to vote in the United States. And so um, these kids here are not able to vote, but the elected leaders that we are electing are making decisions that are going to impact these young people in our communities. And so um, uh, often uh, people talk about voter apathy um, and I really like to shift that uh, to instead of voter apathy, it's it's kind of a um, a, a difference of connection. Um, and uh, instead of people being instead of thinking of people as being apathetic, um, I like to shift that connection piece because most people, if you're if you're even having the conversation about voting with them, they care about their communities. They care about their neighbors. They care about the kids in their community. Um, they maybe are just not seeing the connection between the everyday services that um, that they're accessing and the people that are making decisions about those services. And so um, you can help as a nonprofit leader, you can help to make that connection for people. When you wake up in the morning, do you have access to electricity and internet? Do you walk on public sidewalks? Do you drive on roads that either have or don't have potholes? Um, are there things, you know, all of those things are decided by our elected leaders. And I think there's a lot of focus these days, especially on social issues um, that can be divisive um, in a lot of ways. And it's important to engage on those social issues. Um, but also if people uh, tend to shy away from conversations about that, um, you can remind them that these everyday services that are offered um, are uh, decisions about those things are made by our elected leaders. So that can help to kind of combat that voter apathy or that lack of voter connection. Um, if people are not uh, wanting to vote or they're not feeling like their vote is going to make a difference, um, you can also remind them that they're not just voting for themselves. They're voting for, you know, services for their elderly neighbor down the street, um, for the kids that are playing basketball in the street um, in their neighborhood, right? They are, they're voting for a, a better community for everyone. So that can be a really good reminder as well. I've seen uh, just little uh, anecdote here about an organization I was talking to a couple weeks ago, um, and they work with the local Boys and Girls Club, and the Boys and Girls Club write um, notes to people in their community, like little postcards, um, and send it to adults that say, hey, I these are the things that are important to me. Can you vote for me? Um, like vote kind of in honor of me. And oh my gosh, if I got a note from a, a, a young person in my community, Whew, yeah, that would motivate me um, for sure. So I think that can be really impactful as well. And then as you're doing this work, um, some of the, the logistics of this, um, think about who are your points of contact. So um, when someone engages with your nonprofit, what is one of the first ways that they engage? Do they join your email list? Do they show up to maybe a food bank or some service that you're offering? Um, what are the ways that they're first getting engaged? And how can you incorporate some information about voting into that? Do you have a welcome email that you send to people when they join your mailing list? Can you have a little blurb in there about, hey, make sure you're registered to vote. Here's the link to check your voter registration. That is something that is like a sentence you can add to an email. This is a really simple thing you can do today. Um, uh, think about all of those points of contact and where you can um, uh, integrate some of that voter education into it. Um, think about those trusting relationships too. Who are the people that are going to be um, the best face of that? So, um, you know, do you have certain community members that speak a language other than English? Um, is it important to have someone who 
um, who speaks that language, who can greet that person, um, who can really explain some of those things in that person's native language. Um, where are those trusted relationships? And then you wanna think about um, high traffic areas. So, right, your lobby, if you have a lobby, um, if you often are out tabling in the community at a festival or something like that, um, can you incorporate into your tabling materials some voter registration information or a QR code to register to vote online and just make that a part of your regular outreach um, materials. Um, and then, yeah, community events, festivals, things like that. Think about um, any of those spaces that you're in, especially where you have information about your organization. And how can you take just that extra little step and incorporate some of that voter engagement um, information there. So these are some of the ideas, right? Posters in your lobby, um, QR, we love QR codes these days. They have really made the comeback um, since the pandemic. Um, and so you can put them really anywhere. You can send them uh, directly to the main um, uh, state elections office um, and they can get you know, the most accurate information there. Um, you can distribute sample ballots, voter guides, um, make sure that those sample ballots are not filled in, but um, you can give people a heads up, right? Are they gonna be voting for coroner or for uh, you know, zoning board or something like that? Um, they, so they have that heads up, um, helping people find their polling place. Um, you can hold a special event, make it a party. Um, seems like y'all have a lot of fun um, here in Maine anyway. If you're hanging out with Mary Alice, I know that you are. So um, I, there was a group in Cleveland I was working with and they are hosting a carnivote, like a carnival, um, but it's a carnivote and they're gonna have carnival um, activities. Um, and you know, I'm sure lots of various fried foods um, kind of like a state fair um, and also information about voting. So there's a way to make it fun and engaging and, you know, bring out families and all of that. Um, you can also, this is another example I saw from a um, state, uh, from a, a local organization that works with immigrants. They work particularly with immigrants who are coming from countries where they had a little bit less faith in uh, in the government, a little bit less trust in the voting process. Um, and this nonprofit leader worked with the local board of elections to bring an election uh, voting machine to that community center um, and really walk through the process of this is what's gonna happen when you arrive, this is how they will check your ID, um, this is what happens uh, when you cast your ballot, here are the steps of the process to really help build that trust, especially with communities that um, you know, did not have that trust in the country where they used to live. So things like that to just make the process easier and more connected can be really valuable. And voter registration. So this is the week of voter registration with National Voter Registration Day being on Tuesday. Um, so voter registration can be really crucial in your community. Um, you can get the attention of candidates. So um, uh, elected leaders pay attention to who is registered to vote in their area. And they are going to reach out to communities that are registered to vote and that are regularly voting. So. Um, Registering voters in your area helps to amplify their voices and ensure that they are being listened to by those elected leaders. Um, it builds that, that visibility and that trust. Um, and it also helps to build community leaders. There may be some volunteers that have been coming to you wanting to do something for a while and you're not sure how to engage them. Well, if you um, equip them with the tools to register voters um, or to do some of this voter education, train them up and this is a great activity for them to do. Um, a couple reminders about when you're doing voter registration. Um, you cannot make any suggestions or um, you know, implications about um, which candidate to support or what political party to join. Um, if you get those questions, you want to um, provide any nonpartisan voter guides, um, encourage people to, you know, they can go to those websites if they have questions about Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians or anybody else, um, encourage them to go to those websites to learn 
more about those parties um, and also to talk with friends and neighbors um, about their experience with those um, and to learn more about the candidates. Um, you can also talk about what it means to register without a party affiliation and kind of some of the um, benefits of that if that's the direction they want to go. Um, these are some really uh, some specifics about what, the types of funding that you receive. So um, if you're receiving um, community service block grants or CDPG or any of these funding, do you want to just pay attention to some of the rules around that, around voter um, registration? Also, AmeriCorps members are not able to conduct voter registration during work hours, um, things like that that you want to pay, excuse me, pay attention to as well. And then some best practices as you're uh, putting this plan together. So um, we know as nonprofit leaders that you all are busy. You've got a lot on your plates already. Um, and so uh, it's, it's really key to put this plan on paper, um, really uh, formalize it so that um, you can ensure that it, that it happens at the end of the day and doesn't kind of get um, pushed to the back burner with all the other things you're working on. Often designating a staff person to take the lead on it um, can be really key, make this a part of their role. Um, and, um, and that can ensure that you know, somebody is, is keeping up with it, taking the next steps. Um, you can get that buy-in from your executive director, from staff, from your board. You wanna make sure that everybody knows about this and again, can answer questions. If your development director is talking with donors, um, that they are able to say, hey, uh, you know, here's the information about voter registration. Make sure that you're registered, um, that you're uh, that you're voting, and then build that relationship with your local elections office. Um, you are not bugging them if you reach out and say, hey, we want to help you. Um, we, you know, we want to get voter registration materials. We want to, um, you know, cover. Maybe there are some areas that they know um, need. Uh, more attention and you can help with that, build that relationship um, so you can ask those questions when they come up. Um, they, will, they will be appreciative that you want to get more people engaged in voting. Um, you wanna know some of the details about, you know, uh, about voter registration forms and there are resources um, on our website and also in the voter guide that we've been working on. And then some, some best practices here. Um, so, Internally, um, it, it is okay to start small if this is the first year you are doing some of this voter engagement work um, and you want to start with your staff and your board. That's a great place to start. There is no shame in starting small. Um, and if you want to do, you know, expand to kind of the next level and do this with some key volunteers, it is okay to kind of take the first steps in your program and, um, and keep it simple. Um, and then if you want to do things Outside of your organization, you know, at events, at organization, um, organizational events outside in the community, um, that is wonderful too. Um, so we encourage encourage those. Um, a couple of things to know: uh, lots of people are going to say, "I'm already registered," um, and um, that's okay. Uh, and that's that's really great that they are. Often uh, you want to check and make sure they've updated their address um, since the last time they moved. Um, uh, you might also want to combine that with, hey, have you checked your voter registration? Um, I know there's been some talk about um, purging lists um, or you know updating voter rolls, and so um, it can be really valuable to have folks just check their voter registration. Um, so things like that, also pledge cards to make sure that folks are pledging to vote um, can be really great. This is some of those um, some of those questions. Um, you know, have you moved or changed your name? There are things like that as well that you can ask people um, instead of just that. Are you registered to vote? Which they probably uh, have heard a lot. And then make sure you have a plan to follow up. Um, so I uh, was talking with a group at the National Alliance to End Homelessness Conference a few months ago, and it was a homeless shelter. And they said that there was this wonderful group who came in to register voters at the shelter. They registered a whole lot of voters um, and it was a great program. And then the shelter never heard from that organization again. And a lot of the folks that were staying at the shelter who got registered then didn't have 
any access or any information um, about actually how to turn out and vote. Um, so you want to be sure also that as you do voter registration, you have a plan for reaching back out to those folks, make sure that they have the information that they need to vote, make sure that they have a, a vote ready plan, right? Are they voting early? Do they have transportation? Um, you know, this is a this is a process, right? It's not just a one time point in time uh, event. You want to ensure that um, that the program is is really comprehensive and you're following up there. So that's a lot of information uh, to toss at you here, um, and I'm happy to share um, this PowerPoint um, and any additional resources that we have. Um, uh, wanted to give you just a little bit of, uh, of additional resources here. So we as nonprofit vote have a national webinar series. Um, that is free that folks are able to join. Um, the next one's coming up on October 1st and it's about inclusive and um, accessible practices and voter outreach. We're working with the National Disability Rights Institute, uh, National Center for Disability Rights and um, with Naleo um, publishing a series of Spanish uh, language resources. So that's the next one that's coming up, but they are also all recorded um, on our YouTube channel we have a resource library of all kinds of tools um, that you can have access to, tailored support. We do all this work because we are doing, uh, we have a multi-state field program where we're gaining best practices um, from seven different states across the country, and then we get to bring them to you all. Um, and then the other piece that I'll just highlight here, um, because we're working also with the philanthropic sector, is that um, we spent a lot of time over the past year building out this initiative called Philanthropy for Voter Engagement. Essentially, we realized that nonprofits are not able to do, you know, add this work into all of the wonderful work that you're already doing. And so um, we really need that support of the philanthropic sector to say, hey, we, we know that this work takes um, investment and it takes capacity and we're willing to support that. Um, and we want to ensure that um, you know, you have the, the support of the philanthropic sector and the investment of the philanthropic sector to make that happen. Um, and then organizationally, we are the, the lead organization for National Voter Registration Day, which was this, uh, this week. Um, so please do get involved with that next year um, as well. So I'll share some of these links in the chat. So you've got those resources. My call to action is um, to take the nonprofit vote pledge. Um, you can do that here. Again, I'll put the link in the chat, but um, really that is your, your window and your access to um, additional webinars, additional tools that we publish um, and more information generally. You can kind of become part of this community of nonprofit leaders that are doing voter engagement. That is what I have for you. Thank you so much for listening. And I know I am a, a fast talker, especially um, with some good coffee in the morning. Um, so I will uh, turn it back uh, to you, Mary Alice, for uh, questions. Awesome. Thank you, Gwen. Um, I was reminded as you were talking of a quote that a colleague at the League of yeah, uh, League of Women Voters of Maine told me, which is, every day is a good day to register to vote in Maine. <laughs> and I love it, obviously. But it's a good reminder that in Maine, we have same day voter registration. We have online voter registration. You can do the in person with the green cards, but it, there are like a lot of ways to register. Um, and you can do it every day. A lot of states will have like hard cutoffs and there are cutoffs of, of online registration and mailing in the um, cards. But if you want to register and you haven't done it ahead of time, you can remind people that same day registration exists. You can go to the polls, register in person. Does mean you get in a, a different line on election day. So it's good to register in advance just to save yourself a little time. Um, but every day is a good good day to register to vote in Maine. <laughs> so I will be stealing that and using that. Um, uh, if people have questions, we would love to see those in the chat. Um, and we, yeah, as Gwen said, we'll definitely send um, a ton of resources along. We'll send a bulky. Uh, I'll try to. I'll try to not make it too overwhelming. I have a predilection for sending long resource lists, um, but I'll try to not make it too overwhelming. We'll send that probably on Monday along with the recording. Um, 
Yeah, are there any other questions that folks have? Um, I also, um, we will email you the, that will be in the resource list at the top, Laura, um, to how do we get the 2024 voter engagement guide? That will be at the top of our resource list in the email as part of the follow-up for today. Yeah, thank you. We are excited about it. Um, and, um, I wanted to just also emphasize the, about online voter registration. I think a lot of organizations are um, not necessarily um, direct service or like public facing. And so if you are an organization that does not interface with your audience in person on a regular basis, online voter registration is such a great way to promote engagement with um, the elections. And you, it does it means that you don't have to, you know, turn things in and do the like as intensive training. It's a great way to just put it in your newsletter, put it on social media. You can go to MAMP's social media and copy what we posted earlier this week. Um, so you can just copy and paste if that is what uh, that is what you are capable of doing. We get it. <laughs> um, any other questions? What else we got? I would also love to see um, if anyone's willing to put in the chat, like if there's something that you are going to do between now and election day to promote voter engagement or voter education with your community, um, if it's just putting it in your newsletter, giving staff time off is another thing that we talk about. Um, and MAMP has a blog post, maybe Molly can link in the chat. And so it, um, if you don't want to come up with a formal policy and get that approved by the board, then like um, you, you, you probably um, can, you know, just maybe on the sly. Am I allowed to say that in a recording to just like give your staff some time off to vote and you can come up with a policy? Yeah, encouraging it in your newsletter. But yeah, staff time off. Um, I would give you two thumbs up for giving paid time off to vote. Um, you get one thumb up for time off to vote. <laughs> <laughs> so good so good um uh but that's another great way that you can um just encourage your community because yay thank you angela paid time off to vote that's great um that is i think one thing that gets overlooked a lot is um people are thinking about their community without realizing the people around you are part of your community the people you see every day part of your community um Awesome. Yeah, Rebecca, I see. Encourage it in your newsletter. That's great. Hi, Kasango. Uh, we have a question here. How can the immigrants nonprofit associations get the resources and assistance to assist their communities in the voting process? That's a great question. And one of the um, kind of additional resources that we have in the voter engagement guide is about that. Um, and I think um, a key thing too is there are a lot of organizations in Maine who you can connect with. Um, and so building on partnerships and coalitions is another one of those um, kind of key categories where we always, we're always promoting coalitions, um, but, but getting to know the organizations that are doing that work in your community already is awesome. Um, and there are, if folks are um, less comfortable with English, the League of Women Voters just published their voter toolkit that has information in um, a ton of different languages. And so there's a lot of resources available in that toolkit. Um, and I'll see if maybe Molly can link that too. Um, Oh, great. Thanks. That's a different one, but it is also great. Um, but the League of Women Voters Toolkit has a lot of different, um, like, one pagers about voting in several different translations. And so I can make sure to include that, too. Um, their toolkit is, like, formatted a, a little bit differently than ours is, but um, very specific to Maine and very focused on, like, how to get individual people to feel comfortable and turn out to vote. Yeah. Great question. Any other questions? And I just, I also on that note shared a, yeah. um, a link to a report that um, we did, I believe it was last year um, about unlocking the power of immigrant communities. And there's some data in there that might help as well as your uh, advocating. There's some examples um, of different, what different communities have done, um, but also some best practices in there if that's helpful. Great, awesome. 
Um, cool. Well, I'm going to share my slides. Oh, yeah. Disability Rights Maine is doing awesome work. Um, and they have... Um, they have partnered with League of Women Voters of Maine in the past, but like their ongoing work around uh, accessibility in elections is phenomenal. Um, so I'm just going to share my slides one last time. Um, and um, hopefully you'll see the right. No, it's anyway. Um, why? It, you're seeing all of my slides, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's different every time. Anyway, you can, <laughs> uh, let me switch. Did that help? Yeah. Huh. It wanted a different screen than it wanted before. Anyway, technology is fun. Um, I just wanted to promote a few things that I thought this audience might be interested in. Thanks for understanding with my tech issues. So, um, as you may know, there are a lot of big changes happening with the main policy um, you know, platforms that impact nonprofits broadly. And that's one of the things that I focus on in and out every day. And so um, the retirement savings program, we're doing a second webinar at the end, middle of November about that. And just so folks know in January, that program, um, will change so that there will be um, enforcement penalties that begin. So it's important that you get that aligned. The really big exciting one is um, the blanket sales tax exemption that we fought really hard for. It takes effect January 1 of 2025. And so we're going to do a webinar on Thursday, November 21st at 9 a.m. about that. Um, we're also planning to do a paid family medical leave implementation session, but we don't have a date set. It will be based on the rulemaking um, of of when that is released because it has not been released. And we're working with MPC again uh, on December 13th, Friday the 13th, good luck. We'll be doing um, a legislative preview session with um, MPC, as I said, in Augusta. So that'll be great. And da, 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 we are doing, uh, everybody has, loves MAP Connects. We're doing MAP Connects in person again in Bangor, just about two months, um, focusing on moving from problem solving to possibility. And if that resonates with you, we would love to see you there. Registration is now open. Um, if you have questions after today, you can for sure keep in touch with us in all of these different ways. Um, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you to Gwen and Jeanette and all of you for coming and listening and paying attention and asking questions and engaging. And um, the other thing I just want to say is that according to our member data, Maine has a little bit lower rate of nonprofits participating in elections than the national data. So like, please help us uh, get that number up a little bit. Um, and so you all can be part of the, the, um, the way that we increase those numbers. Um, so thanks for attending and um, we'll be in touch for sure with a lot of information and let us know if you have any more questions and we'll see you later. <laughs>